given your <laughs> expertise, do you think Blake Lemoyne is right? Does this AI, does this bot have feelings? Uh, well, okay. well, no, I, I don't think it does. Um, I certainly don't think it has feelings. Uh, definitely not consciousness or sentience, uh, which, which is what the claims have been. So what does this, though, tell us about the potential or power for AI and bots to fool human beings into thinking that they're real? Yeah, there's a few things going on. Um, on the one hand, we have uh, psychological effects of um, interacting with things that are human-like. Um, so uh, we, we tend to anthropomorphize. Um, we tend to put intentionality um, into things that we're, we're, that we're inter interacting with that seem human-like. Uh, I think people are sort of used to doing this with their pets and things, you know, creating like whole dialogues and conversations, um, but also with like, you know, uh, stuffed animals and Tamagotchis and uh, things like that. And there's also been psychological studies showing that we have a propensity to um, impute intentionality uh, into um, non-conscious beings um, when they show uh, some sort of properties like speaking, uh, like vulnerability um, or, or movement uh, that's aligned with human-like movement. Um, on the other hand, we also have a lot of companies working in AI using the language of human cognition. Um, so saying things like chain of thought, saying things like reasoning, um, you know, essentially comparing the models that they're working with to the brain, which makes some sense, but you really have to temper that with, with the details of this essentially being um, a, bunch of, a bunch of calculations. Um, so we have a few things going on, the psychological illusions uh, and the language that companies are using around the technology they're building. So given the complexity of this, what are your biggest concerns about, for example, these transcripts that, that Blake Lemoyne published where the computer is saying, I'm scared of dying. I'm scared <laughs> of being turned off. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I echo um, a lot of researchers in this space um, where I think we all sort of feel like sentience is, is not the point here. Um, I think it's I think it's important to note that we are not going to get an agreement on sentience or consciousness anytime soon. People are going to see sentience. People are going to see consciousness, um, and that will probably go on, you know, indefinitely, where we just have a disagreement. Um, but when you do have people starting to see sentience and consciousness, um, it starts to bring up things like. Um, you know, like robot rights, all this work that's been done on what the personhood of uh, these models might be. Um, well, at the same time, you have technology that, you know, essentially discriminates, you know, against black and brown people, um, poorly represents women and reflects misogynistic viewpoints. Uh, so there's something to be said for an obsession with the personhood of AI and AI systems. Um, and thinking about the rights that they might have while not actually doing good work on the rights of actual people. Um, on top of, oh, I have so much to say, but yeah, you have another <laughs> question, I'm sure. Well, you know, and of course, you know, the history behind this is that you were fired for your work in sounding the alarm about sexism and racism in, a, in AI at Google. So it sounds yeah. to me like you're saying, this isn't the problem. We shouldn't be asking if robots have feelings and rights. We should be asking yeah. if AI is gender blind and color blind and making sure um, that we're focusing on all of these other things that are far more important. Yeah, I mean, so it's not gender blind. It's actually uh, targeting gender in negative ways. Um, mm -hmm. And so, for example, we know that a lot of these systems are trained on um, text data from, from websites that have uh, misogynistic tendencies um, and uh, websites that are predominantly uh, white and male. 
um, and, and actually US-based. Um, so there's all these kinds of things that are being um, propagated by these systems that are really problematic. Um, and they become even more problematic when people start to be affected by the systems as they interact with them. Um, so in the case of consciousness, um, you have the concern that people might be persuaded to do horrible things. Um, you also have you know, concerns around bullying and hate bots uh, and these kinds of things that can you know, really hurt people. Um, and then you, know, you also have um, these subtle effects of you know, in search ranking results, what will tend to appear at the top of that ranking. And if it's a function of these sorts of language models, um, as Google, for example, has said um, they are, then you're going to have these bias effects influencing search results in such a way that you tend to see the viewpoints of white men, you know, at the top of the search ranking results as opposed to, you know, black women. And that is sort of a uh, echo a chamber effect where it's like uh, the privileged gets more privileged, right? Privilege begets privileged while the marginalized become more marginalized. Now, Google has come out saying that in this particular case, when it comes to Blake Lemoyne, that you know, hundreds of researchers have interacted with the same technology, haven't expressed these concerns. I also sat down with Alphabet and Google CEO Sundar Pichai last year and asked him about concerns around AI from within Google itself, from people like yourself. I asked him what keeps him up at night. Take a listen to what he had to say. Anytime we, you're developing technology, there is a dual side to it. Mm -hmm. I think the journey of humanity is harnessing the benefits while minimizing the downsides. Mm -hmm. The good thing with AI is it's both going to take time. I think I've seen more focus on the downsides early on than most other technology we've developed. So in some ways, I'm encouraged by how much concern there is. Mm -hmm. And you're right, even within Google, you know, uh, you know people think about it deeply. Margaret, do you think he and Google are leading on these issues in the right way? No, clearly not. I mean, everyone, I think, at least in tech, is familiar with this notion of tech solutionism. Um, and there's no lack of PR and comms around the benefits of AI and really trying to push it as beneficial for humanity and all these sorts of things. It's, it's a very small minority who speaks up um, about the da downsides. So I would say that um, Sundar's characterization, characterization is false. Um, and frustratingly false. Um, and one of the reasons I think that there's a desire to steer away from the downsides, um, in addition to you know, concern around uh, profit, is that it also starts to open up liability, right? So if you have systems that you can show work worse on black women, then now it starts to bring up questions of discrimination within the systems. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it behooves companies uh, to try and say, oh, the downsides are, you know, are being over-examined and try and kind of uh, shut that conversation down. But I think what's actually happening is that the small set of people who have been speaking about ethical concerns are starting to be listened to because people are seeing the negative effects. Um, and I, I think that's really what's happening is the desire on the corporate side to shut the conversation down for a lot of sort of incentives they have. And then people actually seeing the downsides and that having an effect on what gets reported. Do you think Lemoyne should have been suspended? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I So I should say that um, uh, Blake and I are really good friends. Uh, we work together at Google. We wrote a paper together actually on how to um, mitigate problematic biases in, um, in machine learning systems. Um, he's a very, very bright guy. Um, so uh, I'm a little bit worried that there's sort of this reductive narrative that there's something like fundamentally wrong with him or something. Um, he, he has a lot of dimensions. Um, and I think Google could have done a much better job at engaging with him rather than this you know, very alienating uh, sort of experience that they gave him instead. Um, I think it shows a weakness on Google's part to be able to, um, uh, to be able to be open to different kinds of experiences and perspectives. So what are your biggest fears if Google continues to develop the technology at the pace that it is developing this technology, continues to, you know, potentially not listen to this, as you say, minority of voices that are speaking up?
Paint the picture of, of what you fear the world could look like if Google continues on this path. Oh, no. <laughs> that is a very big question. Um, and I'm not a good painter. Uh, I should mention <laughs> I'm a computer scientist, so I might not, you know, be as uh, eloquent at this. Um, but, I, you know, we're already seeing a lot of uh, what we can expect to happen in the future, but even worse. Um, so just recently, someone released a ton of hate bots um, and then made the model available to the public. Um, and so we are going to likely see an increase of hateful, um, intelligent seeming systems um, across our interactions online and on social media. Um, and this includes things like bullying, as well as really problematic uh, persuasion into sort of more ex extremist um, uh, er areas. Um, I think we're going to see uh, further sort of marginalization and worsening of power differentials. So as, you know, a company like Google amasses more and more um, ability to affect people's sense of, of what's true in the world through search ranking results, uh, through the sort of uh, products they're making, um, it means that the voices of people who have less access to the internet, for example, are going to disappear more and more while Google hmm. amasses more and more power. Um, and so I'm very, very concerned about how much this sort of technology moving forward empowers Google um, and the sort of lack of respect uh, that I've seen for very serious ethical concerns, you know, uh, misinformation obviously is one. Alongside some of the models that have come out recently, we're not going to know what's real. There's going to be text-based text misinformation, so, so news that's wrong. Uh, Image-based misinformation, so images that look real that, that are not real. Um, and video-based as well and also audio-based. So essentially, all of the main ways that we consume information online will now no longer be very easy uh, to trace back to reality. Um, okay. And that means mass misunderstanding. 